work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained, what is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you visit him? Father, we thank you, God, again for today that we can come before you, that we can meet together in this country still in freedom, and we can worship the God of heaven, of all creation. So we pray that you be glorified today, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. Uh, for all new faces, I'm Jake. For all old faces, I'm still Jake. <laughs> <laughs>
Well, we've been walking through the book of John. We've gotten to into the sixth chapter. We just covered the uh, feeding of the 5,000. <clears throat> So we're going, to, uh, we're going to get into the fifth sign. If you remember John, in his book, when Jesus does things, he doesn't call them miracles. He calls them signs. And if you remember why, in uh, chapter 20, verse 31, John said this. He said, so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. That's why John is focused on the signs that Jesus did. He calls them signs because they're signs to point to who Jesus Christ actually is. That he is God in the flesh. And that's John's purpose. On the, on the evangelistic side of the book is to show people that Jesus Christ is God. But he calls them signs. He doesn't just call them miracles. Some of the other, other gospels will call them miracles. But John, John wants to show you some signs that point to who he actually is. So, so far, as walking through the book, we've seen uh, water turn to wine. That was the first sign. The second sign was that Jesus healed the nobleman's son from a distance. The third sign was that Jesus healed the man in the pool of Bethesda. When he told him to get up, pick up your bed, and walk. The last sign we looked at was the feeding of 5,000. Or we could probably say the feeding of the 20,000. Because it was men, 5,000 men, not including women and children. Well, today in chapter 6, we're going to look at um, the miracle of Jesus walking on water. Okay, the miracle of Jesus walking on water is recorded in three of the Gospels. We have Matthew 14, Mark 6, and John chapter 6. And that's the one we're going to be reading. It comes right after the feeding of the 5,000 when he fed that many people with just a couple of loaves of bread, five loaves of bread and two fish. This is the Sea of Galilee. We probably have half of the Sea of Galilee in that picture. This is where this story takes place. The story in chapter 6 unfolds at the Sea of Galilee, which lies in the lower portion of the Jordan Valley, in a mountain range that rises 4,000 feet above sea level. Some pretty high mountains. The Sea of Galilee itself is 700 feet below sea level. So it's quite a change, quite a difference. <clears throat> One well-known aspect of this body of water, even today, is that it is greatly susceptible to sudden and extreme violent storms, even today. This wasn't just a, a happening that happened in Jesus' day. It goes on today, still. The storms are caused by the cold air that rushes down the mountains and clashes with the warm air coming off of the water. Just like we have tornadoes today. That's the recipe for a tornado. Cold air, hot air coming together starts to rotate and causes a tornado. But that's the kind of storms that they deal with on this. It's actually a lake. It's called the Sea of Galilee because of tradition. Okay, as we go through this story, I have three main points, points that we're going to look at. There are storms in life, even in the path of obedience. Jesus always comes to us in the storms of life. 
And Jesus proves himself to be in command of the elements, something only God can do. Okay, so if you have your Bibles, and I hope you do, here's a little picture. If you have your Bibles, I hope you do. Let's turn to John chapter 6. If you need a Bible, there's Bibles on the back table, or you can just listen. And you're welcome to keep those Bibles if you need one. John chapter 6. We're going to start at verse 15 and read through verse 21. So Jesus, perceiving, now this is... This is at the end of the feeding of the 5,000, after he fed the crowds. Verse 15 says, So Jesus, perceiving that they were intending to take him by force and make him a king, he withdrew again to the mountain by himself, alone. Now when the evening came, his disciples went down to the sea. And after getting into a boat, they started to cross the sea to Capernaum. It had already become dark, and Jesus had not yet come to them. The sea began to be stirred up because of a strong wind was blowing. Then, when they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus coming to them on the sea and drawing near to the boat. And they were frightened. But he said to them, It is I, do not be afraid. So they were willing to receive him into the boat. And immediately, the boat was at the land in which they were going. Okay, now, as I read, as I give some insight to the story, what I'm going to do is I'm going to merge uh, the three Gospels together, Matthew, Mark, and John. Okay, I would encourage you, if you ever, if you can, get, there's a book that's called The Merged Gospels. Uh, Gary Crossland, I think is who it's by. And in The Merged Gospels, he takes all the stories of the different Gospels, because a lot of them cover the same stories, the different uh, points to the stories, and he merges them together. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk through a little bit. As we go through this, I'm going to be reading out of the merged gospel, because then it brings some points from the other gospels together. Okay? So we're going to go to verse 15, and we'll walk through, the, through this text together. Then Jesus knowing that they were about to come and take him by force, that they might make him king. Immediately, he made, he compelled, he insisted his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side. The Bible says hey, Jesus compelled them. Remember, he was their master. He was the one that they were following. The Bible says, if we look at the Greek words, he used the word compel, or he made them to get into the boats. In John, it just says the disciples got into the boat. The other Gospels cover the story fuller, and they say that Jesus compelled them to get into the boat. Compelled means it's a necessity. He compelled them. He drove them to. He constrained them, whether by force, threats, or by persuasion. Jesus, as their leader, as their master, as their rabbi, told them, get in the boats and get out of here. Go to the other side of the lake. That's the, the feeling of the story when you get into the original language. He told them, get to the other side. Why? Why would Jesus be so forceful and compelling them to get in the boats and go? But we just read that the crowd was coming and they wanted to make Jesus a king. If you remember... Back in the other gospel, in, that, in the gospel of Mark, Matthew, chapter 4, Jesus was already tempted with that. Remember when he went into the desert and Satan tempted him. For 40 days, he was in the desert. Satan tempted him. And this is what, what happened. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain. Jesus was in a mountain just now. And showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, All these will I give you, if you will fall down and worship me. Jesus already rejected that from Satan. And now the people were coming to him because of the miracle of feeding the people. They wanted to make him a king. 
over their nation. They wanted to do away with the Roman rule, and he was the man. And look, he can provide us food every day. So Jesus did not want his disciples falling for that temptation, falling for the uh, idea of being a king. First of all, if Jesus would have became king, hey, they would second Remember, we just all the stories we read through, I touched on the fact that they were very naturally minded. They were still looking at fleshly things. They kept missing the idea of the kingdom being a spiritual kingdom. So Jesus forcefully told them, get in the boat, get to the other side. In verse 16 and 17 it says, And after bidding them farewell, and after he sent the crowds away, he departed and went up again into the mountain alone by himself to pray. And when it was evening, he was there alone on the land. But they were going over to the sea of, over the sea to Capernaum. And darkness had already come. And Jesus had not come to them. So Jesus, when, the crowd, when he sent his disciples away, he went up into the mountain to pray. What was he praying for? What do you think he was praying for? I think the question to ask is not what he was praying for, but who was he praying for? Remember, his disciples were just put on notice about this making him a king. That was a temptation to them. So Jesus went up into the mountain. If you follow the scriptures through John chapter 17, Jesus prayed for his disciples continually. And he also prayed for all people continually. You'll see it in uh, Acts, you'll see it in John, you'll see it all through the Gospels. That Jesus prayed for his people. So Jesus was up in a mountain, and we're assuming that he doesn't say it, but he was praying probably for his disciples in the midst of this temptation. Maybe he was praying that God, Father, just allow them to see the truth in this, allow them to see who I really am. Because they've missed it all along the way. Remember, when he fed the 5,000, he asked them, how can we feed these people? And they didn't even, it didn't even click in their minds that he just healed somebody. He just went through these other miracles. Surely he can provide bread. It didn't even click. They were naturally minded people. So Jesus is up in the mountain praying for them. It says in Romans 8.34, Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is who died, yes, rather who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. Even now, Jesus is at the right hand of the Father in heaven, interceding for us and for our needs. He's praying for his people. In verse 18 it says, And the sea began to be stirred up, because a strong wind was blowing. Therefore, when they had rowed about three or four miles, the boat was in the middle of the sea, away from the land, battered by the waves. And he was seeing them straining at the oars, for the wind was contrary to them. So we see that they were rowing for three or four miles. Now, as far as I can tell from looking things up, it's only about six miles across the Sea of Galilee. It's about six, six to eight miles across the Sea of Galilee. So if they were going across the sea, and they rode four miles, the scripture is right, it says, obviously the scripture is right, but it says that they were in the middle of the sea. And they were battered by the wind and the waves. Now if you talk to a captain of a boat, talk to a captain of a ship, there's no problem when there's a storm when you're in a boat. It can rain and rain and rain and rain and it doesn't matter. The boat is built to withstand the rain. It's made to drain the rain. It's made for the rain to run off of it. That's what it's made for. The captain will tell you, don't fear the rain. Fear the wind. Because wind creates waves. Waves tip the boat over. Well, they were in a little fishing boat. We don't know how the size of the boat was. So point number one, there are storms in life, 
even in the path of obedience. Even if you're walking with Jesus Christ in obedience, there are storms in life that come. Matthew 5.45 says, So that you may be the sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes the sun to rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. It doesn't matter whether you're just or unjust, whether you're saved or lost. It doesn't matter whether you're serving God or living for yourself. Storms in life come. Now, they come for different reasons. Sometimes a storm in your life will come for discipline. The Bible says that if we're children of God, He disciplines us when we get out of line, just like we discipline our children. He disciplines us to bring us back to where we should be. But maybe sometimes a storm in your life will come to build you up or to draw faith out of you. Remember, we looked at that in some of the other miracles that um, Jesus Christ was trying to draw faith out of people. And sometimes God will allow storms in your life um, to draw faith out of you, to get you to trust Him more. Sometimes you'll get a storm in your life just so God can reveal Himself to you. Sometimes it takes a storm for us to pay attention in our life. Sometimes something happens and it's all like, all of a sudden, whoa, wait, okay. You ever be in the backyard or in your yard somewhere out in the field doing something, and all of a sudden, man, there's this big, loud crack of thunder. Everybody stops. Whoa, what's that? To get your attention. So sometimes God allows storms in our life just to get a hold of you, just to open your eyes, open your ears, okay. What is this all about? Okay, the Bible says that it was about the fourth watch of the night. He came to them walking on the sea. The Roman clock had four watches. The first watch was 6 p.m. to 9 p.m. The second watch was 9 p.m. to 12 a.m. The third watch was 12 a.m. to 3 a.m. And the fourth watch was 3 a.m. to 6 a.m. Now get the picture in your mind. They were up in the mountains. Started, it says when they got into the boat and they went, and Jesus saw them, it had gotten dark. So let's take a guess. It's 7 o'clock at night. And they're out on a ship. They're out on a boat in the middle of the sea. This is saying that Jesus came to them at between 3 and 6 a.m. They, they've got a... Oh, I forgot to look it up. I think it was a four-hour row to get across the lake. Now, they've been rowing from 7 a.m., 7 p.m. to between 3 and 6 a.m. They've been rowing for eight or nine hours, and they've only gotten to the middle of the lake. That's how fierce of a storm it was. Keep it in perspective. That's how bad this storm was. That brings us to point number two. Point number two of the miracle is that Jesus always comes to us in the storms of life. This reminds me of the words of God to Isaiah. In Isaiah 43, 2, he says this. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you're in the waters, when you're in the storm, they will not overtake you. Okay, though the uh, disciples were only tri to travel a short distance, the storm was so violent that despite all their efforts to control the boat, the storm had gotten them to the middle of the sea. They were rowing for about eight or nine hours. We're assuming from 7 p.m. to 3 a.m., somewhere in that fourth watch when Jesus came to them. Something to think about that the Lord may not come at the time that we think He should come. Even when you're in the midst of the water and you feel like the water is coming over your head, He might not come at the time that you think that He should show up. But 
Jesus knows when we need him most. Remember what we've always said. Your emergency is his opportunity. I hope that gets imprinted in your mind. No matter what you're doing, no matter what the storm of life is like, your emergency is God's opportunity. Jesus Christ is never in a hurry. It, what he's doing is working in you to draw faith out of you. So sometimes you'll be in that storm longer than you'd like to be in it. Jesus had waited until the boat was as far from land as possible. They were in the middle of the sea. One way or the other, they would have been close to land. They were in the middle. Jesus waited for them to be in the middle of the sea. When all their hope was gone. Now remember, these guys are fishermen. Okay? These guys are big, strong fishermen. They did this every day. This is what they did. They know how to handle a boat, even in a storm. But Jesus waited until they were in the middle of the ocean, in the middle of the sea, and all their hope was gone. Jesus was testing the disciples' faith. And this meant removing every human prop that they had. What Jesus did was waited for the time. They just got done rowing eight or nine hours. They only got from the shore to the middle of the sea. And Jesus waited until all hope was gone. They were wore out. I don't know if you've ever rowed a boat, but go out and row a boat in wavy water for eight or nine hours. Your forearms, arms are going to be the size of your body by the time they finish. But Jesus was testing their faith, and he waited to the opportunity when every human prop was removed. Okay? Their strength was gone. Their wisdom was gone. Their ingenuity was gone. They were probably at the point of giving up. Like, man, we, we just can't get anywhere. They knew what to do. They were fishermen. But they were whipped. They were physically wore out, probably mentally wore out, emotionally wore out. They'd been struggling for eight or nine hours. They were tired. Then, the disciples see Jesus walking on the sea and drawing near the boat. For they all saw him, and they were frightened. They supposed that it was a ghost, and they cried out for fear. Now get the picture here, because the Bible, when you read it in the book of John, it's, John just does a very small synopsis of the story. But the other Gospels bring everything in, when you go back to the original language of the Scriptures, it gets pretty powerful. You know that it's hard to see and it's hard to hear in the storm. You know that. You've never been out in the storm. It's hard to pay attention to what somebody's saying, what somebody's over there. It's hard to see the wind is in your face, the rain's in your face. Um, they're out on the oak, they're out on the sea. The wind is blowing, the waves are crashing. Um, they're war out, and they see Jesus coming. And it says that they were frightened. The word frightened in the Greek is phobos, or phobos. It means panic, flight. You ever heard of fight or flight? This is flight. They had no fight in them left. They were ready to run, and there was nowhere to go. They were in terror. The word means to flee, to withdraw. They had nowhere to go. He's a grown man, strong man, in this boat, trapped in the waves, see Jesus coming, were scared to death and they had nowhere to go. So what happened? It says that they cried out. The Greek word for cried out is kradso. It means to scream. It means to cry aloud. It means to shriek. Inarticulate shoutings that express deep emotion. You got the picture? bunch of strong fishermen in the boat that have been wore out. All of a sudden they see Jesus on the water and they scream like 12 year old girls. That's what the picture is. They were scared to death. It wasn't that they were just unsure of what would have said. When they saw him, it says they were frightened to flight, to terror. 
And they cried out. They screamed with a shriek. Because they were scared to death. I love that. I love the picture of that. Because as I read it, it's kind of like, yeah, yeah, we're men. We're tough guys, aren't we? I don't know if you've ever been scared to death. But all of a sudden, our voices get pretty high. <laughs> So I, I picture them, these big men in the boat, and they just scream like these little girls. Like, ah, what is that? And I love this part. But immediately, Jesus spoke to them and said to them, Take courage. It is I. Be not afraid. Getting into the Greek again. But you've got to know what this means. Uh, some of the Bible say, It is I. It's me. Uh, whatever term they use, different versions use different terms. Uh, mine says, it is I. Be not afraid. The term, it is I, in the Greek, is ego, I, me. Ego, I, me. And what that means? I am. That's what it means. Jesus walking to them on the water, remember, they don't know, they haven't settled on this fact that Jesus Christ is God. He comes to them on the water, and he says, Ego, I, me. He says, I am. Be not afraid. In the Greek, Ego, I, me, looks back to God's only name, Yahweh, the Lord, meaning he who always was, is, and always will be. Jesus told them point blank, do not be afraid, I am. So it bears a question in the story, why did Jesus walk on water? Jesus could have just told them when they were up in the mountain, hey guys, I am, don't be afraid. In Psalm 77, 17, maybe Jesus was reminding them. He met them on the water. And maybe he was reminding them of a couple of Old Testament scriptures. In Psalm 77, 19, it says this. Your way was through the sea. Your path through the great waters. Yet your footprints were unseen. Or maybe he was thinking of Job 9, 8. Who alone stretched out the heavens and trampled the waves of the sea? Remember, these were Jews. These guys were Jews. These guys knew the Old Testament. They knew the writings in the Old Testament. They knew the scriptures in the Old Testament that pointed to who God was and that spoke about God. And they knew the term I am was God. It was the name of God. So Jesus walked on the water. Why? To show his disciples that the very thing they feared, listen to this. He walked on the water to show the disciples that the very thing that they feared, the wind, the raging sea, was merely a set of steps or a path for him to come to them. Got their attention? The raging sea became a path for Jesus Christ to come to them. And to show them who he was. That brings the third point. The third point is that Jesus proved himself to be in command of the elements. Something that only God can do. We know that only the creator is in control of everything. He revealed this truth to the disciples who recognized his divinity and responded with a confession of faith in Jesus as God. The wind died down. This is continuing in the scriptures. The wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. This was the first time in scripture, the first time Jesus was called the Son of God by the disciples. 
you got their attention. Now that statement, um, truly you are the Son of God, you have to think through Scripture, you have to think back. Okay? There was a time, I think I have this Scripture, Matthew 28. They had a question. There was another storm, remember? There was another storm in the Scriptures, before this storm, when Jesus calmed the storm. He was asleep in the boat. This is what it says. And behold, there arose a great storm on the sea, so that the boat was being swamped by the waters, or by the waves. But he was asleep, and they went and woke him, saying, Save us, Lord, we are perishing. And he said to them, Why are you afraid? Oh, you of little faith? Then he rose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. And the men marveled, saying, What sort of man is this? And even the winds and the sea obey him. The first storm they asked the question. In the second storm, the question gets answered. Here they have an answer to their question. Truly. What sort of man is this? Truly. You are the Son of God. This is also the first time that the disciples worshipped him. Notice that their worship is joined to their confession. And this is what worship is. Acknowledging who God is and praising him both for who he is and for what he has done. It was in this story that the disciples took the first step and worshipped Jesus as the Son of God. This is what happened to them. They went from fear to faith. They went from confusion to confession. They went from wondering who he is to worship him as the Son of God. So the question is this, is God working in your life? Is he working in your life? Are you in the midst of a storm of any kind? Remember, he's trying even in the midst of a storm, he's trying to bring you to this place. He's trying to bring you from fear to faith. Let go of your trust in yourself and to trust him. That's why Jesus waited for the disciples to be at a place where they had nothing else to do. They were wore out. And then he came to them. And that's when they realized he's God. He said, I am. But don't be afraid. God's wanting to bring you from confusion to confession. Maybe you're confused about who Jesus is. Maybe you're confused about this Christian life and how does this actually work and how does it all play out. Maybe you're confused of who he actually is. Well, he wants to bring you from confusion to confession that you can see him for who he truly is. He wants to bring you from wondering all about these things to worshiping Him. That's His desire in your life. Even if the storm gets hard and heavy, His desire is to take you from there to Him. He's trying to bring you to those things. So are you trusting Him? when you're in the midst of a storm, or if you're in the midst of a beautiful sunny day in your life, are you trusting Him? You're putting your hope in Him and not in yourself, not in the things of this world? Are you trusting Him even in the storms? That's the picture of this. 
That's the story. Even in the midst of the storm, he's telling you, don't be afraid. Trust me. I'm in control of even the weather. You have a storm in your life now? I can make it calm. I can make it stop. I control the weather. Okay, I'm going to end with this. I'm going to end with Psalms 23. Most of us probably can quote it. You know, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. I'm going to go to verse 4. And we're going to end with this. 23.4 says, Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. I am. You are with me. From fear to faith. You are with me. stand, we'll pray, and we'll worship you. God, we thank you again, Father, for just all that you in our lives. Thank you for the sunny days when we can cruise through life and feel like we're on top of the world. We know that you're with us. We thank you, God, for the storms that come into our life for different reasons. Sometimes you want to chasten us because we're children that have gone astray. Sometimes you want to bring our attention back to you because we've fallen for the lies of this world. Sometimes, God, we know the storm rages just to get our attention. But whatever the purpose is, we know, according to your word, that you're the one in control of it. We have no control over the storms in our life. Yeah, we can work things out, Father, for in our own human strength. But we know that when you come to us and we hear you say, I am, be not afraid. God, what a reliance that is. Really. What, a, what, a, what a rock to lean upon. And we know that you're in control of everything. God, help us to be surrendered to you. In all that we do, all that we say, how we live. Help us to be mindful of you when you speak to us. God, help us to read your word. And help us to be alert. Help us to, to hear from you. We pray, Father, as the disciples were in the boat, as they came to that place that they were at the end of themselves, that we too would see Jesus at that time. And for anybody in here, Father God, that who's not saved, who's not given their hearts and their lives to you, I pray, God, that you would reveal yourself to them completely. I pray that they would see you for who you are. And that they would cry out like your disciples. True, you are the Son of God. We ask that you would do that for your glory and for your honor.
Jesus' name.